So, listen, a couple things. You're, just see, keep in mind, we'll, we'll send an email out. We're going to stay, stay attached to a lot of things, but the first backpacks are due on uh, s- s- this coming Sunday night, so you have time. Um, if you haven't been able to register through Canvas, uh, just go to the website, and we explain how to do it not on Canvas, but we'll send an email out explaining that. Okay, so a um, couple things. Make sure, hey, make sure you wear your mask properly, okay? We, we know, we're, we're all in this together. So, and it's kind of like, ugh, but we're in it together. So, um, okay, let's keep going. Just a, a quick thing. I'm doing a project with TRT World, and this is uh, kind of like the Tur- Turkish version of, of CNN. It's their, it's their global English channel. And the project involves looking at, the, um, at hate directed toward people of Asian ancestry. And if, you, if you've had some kind of experience, uh, if you, you are of Asian ancestry and you've had some kind of experience, just talk, talk to me briefly after, cl- after class. Tell me what it is. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's you. Um, I just want to hear about it uh, as part of the project. Okay. And uh, next thing. Um, I don't usually do this, but I'm going to try to do it every Tuesday. And also, by the way, keep the, make sure you really keep the attendance sheets moving. Okay. There's g- going to be a pen linked with each one. They're different now. It's back to back. So... This is going to be the final attendance sheet, so really keep them, keep them moving forward. Um, so I don't usually do this, but I'm going to try to do it every Tuesday, uh, kind of really know what the class is going to be on Thursday. And, and, and I want to say something about this, and I want to say something about last class. So, um, you know, everything, this entire class, is critical race theory. So be, a, be aware that wh- whatever you hear about, like a critique of critical race theory or people thinking one thing or another, understand Social 119 is critical race theory. I've been doing critical race theory for 30 plus years. And critical race theory is simply having a, a conversation about race and culture and ethnicity and ancestry about the many different dimensions of it. That's all critical race theory is. It's not, if you do it poorly, you're, then you're, you know, you're probably, if you do it poorly, it means you're not seeing issues from multiple sides. Um, Maybe you have this idea that it's your job to kind of indoctrinate people or who knows, get them to think the way you think. Um, I used to be more like that when I was younger. You know, like for me, teaching was, an opportunity to kind of just speak my mind to the world, like what I thought about the world. And what I thought was naturally, um, I, I had the idea that what I thought was right. Because if I didn't think it was right, I wouldn't think it. You know, we all have that, right? I mean, except the, those of us who are really, truly psychopaths. But I, so I had the idea that for me, many years ago, when I first started teaching, like the classroom was a place not to indoctrinate people, but to you know, clue them in to what I thought were really important and interesting ideas. And they were essential to the world. But over time, what I realized was most of my students didn't care. And, you know, like, no matter what I said, they would walk away with their own ideas because, you know, most people are kind of half listening. And, you know, you don't, no matter what I say, you you can't download it into your mind and, and, and do a takeaway. And so at most people would remember one or two simple ideas, and that was it. And then I I started to have this realization over time that it really doesn't matter a lot what happens, the content of what happens in a classroom like this. What matters is that you feel inspired, that students would feel inspired to go out and search for answers on their own. At best, right? Because you can't memorize things. You know, this idea, this idea that teachers indoctrinate students is really silly. Because you, you can't indoctrinate. You know what I mean? You can't remember. So there, there it is. Anyway. Last class was probably a little bit uncomfortable for some people 
who think that maybe we're making too much of an issue talking about race. Maybe we talk about history too much. We should talk about the present. Why are we getting bogged down in this? Or maybe I was, you, you maybe felt like I was sort of, you know, hammering away at, at, at white people. I used the word white supremacy at one point. Remember that? And so, like, some people who here who think that we really need to talk about race inequality and we really need to talk about the history of people who have been othered in the United States, especially black people. And so, you, you know, I did that. And I did it from a very critical perspective. And so for many of you, um, you probably felt like, ah, oh, this was really refreshing to hear. But for some of you, you, you were probably a little bit uncomfortable. Like, wait, why are we talking about this? Like, this seems one-sided to me. Like, what about the other, there are other issues that we should talk about? What about, what about some of the other things? Is this all it's going to be? Are we just going to talk about white people, talk about power, and talk about this sort of thing? Like, what about some other perspectives, right? So, with that in mind, what I want to say is, um, Thursday, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a sociology of policing. And what I want you to know is that this is actually going to be a little bit risky of a class because I'm not going to I'm not going to take the side of that police as an institution policing as an institution is violent and racist I'm not going to take that side and I'm actually going to take the side that says policing is very complicated the vast majority of police are doing a great job and the racism, the degree to which racism exists in policing, you have to really dig in. To, there's the obvious stuff, right? But most of what people talk about the really obvious stuff is not common to everyday policing. And there's a perspective in the United States right now, a left perspective that is just really critical and anti-police. And I want to challenge that perspective. And so, Thursday's class is the kind of class that you could put on Fox News and be like, yeah, this guy really gets, gets it. He really sees this, right? The Fox people would be like, oh yeah, this guy, right? Last, last Thursday's class, people who think Fox News is the truth and so on, would hate it, would think, yeah, we were right about this asshole. He's, you know, critical race theory, indoctrinating students, and all this kind of stuff, and like, yeah, okay. But this coming Thursday, it's going to be a very different story. So if you were a little bit uncomfortable on in last Thursday's class, probably this Thursday's class, there's going to be a lot of points at which you will be much more likely to, to feel like, oh, yeah, finally, I'm, you know, like I'm hearing somebody critique some of these perspectives about race and policing and white supremacy and inequality and that sort of thing, okay? So, I just want to say that. That's what this is. That's what this class is. I'm going to come from different angles constantly, but this, I'm, re I'm really looking forward to it. And by the way, um, it'd be really nice if I had a couple of people in class who, uh, I know we have one, the very first of the two gentlemen who volunteered, one of you said your father was a police officer, but it'd be nice to have somebody else whose family is in policing, or maybe you're going into policing, um, and somebody who's had some really negative, just troubling, disturbing, uh, a couple experiences with the police, especially if you're black or brown, okay? So it'd be really nice to have, that's so I'm, I'm asking for a certain volunteer, not, not today, next class, but see me after class and let me know, okay? So that would be really nice to have as volunteers. Okay, um, it's really important to have because we're going to have this conversation. It's a really challenging conversation. I think I'm going to be really thoughtful, but we'll see. You can be the judge of that, right? Um, all right. Uh, okay, Mariam, I want to introduce two people to you today. We're going to have a. We're going to start. We're going to do the first like kind of half hour of class. Uh, this is Mariam. She, you will, if you send emails to the staff email about global, well, hang on. You see, say what you do. <laughs> oh, wait. Click it on. There we go. All right. Hi, I'm Mariam. I am a junior here at Penn State. Hold it, and hold it close. one of the interns at World in Conversation. 
So um, today, I'm just going to go over, oh, it's right there. I'm just going to be going over your dialogues and just clarify some information. So um, this semester, you have a total of seven dialogues to complete, but you have six blocks this semester, meaning that for one block, you want to register for two dialogues, one global and one local, so you can make up for the seven dialogues that is required today. Wait, only, only one, right? So hang on. I'm up here, Mariam, up here in the middle. <laughs> Wait, so let, no, go back to the local, right? All so right. it's one per block, right? Yeah. So um, you, you are required to complete one global dialogue this entire semester, but you have seven dialogues in total to complete. But you have six blocks. Did that make sense? So you have six blocks, but seven dialogues, meaning that for one block, you want to register for one global dialogue and one local dialogue. Okay. So you can make up the seven dialogues required. Awesome. Perfect. And, yeah, okay. and explain that seats thing. Yeah. That's important. All right. So for each week for the local dialogues, there are 390 seats open. And like for week one, 390. Week two, 390. But for the global dialogues, there are only 65 seats open. So if you go to register and you do not see any seats open for global dialogues, do not like worry. Like it's just 65. That's why they fill up really fast. And... Yeah. So, so the idea is that because you're only doing one global, we're splitting them up between 12 weeks, mm -hmm. right? So don't freak out and say, because I know I say you won't get an A in this class if you don't do a global. Mm -hmm. So don't freak out. You got it. Some of you will be doing globals in the very last week, and that's okay. Just don't miss a global. Anyway, okay. Yeah. Um, Can you go to the next slide? Uh, all right. So these are some of the countries that we will, be, like you will, have in your global dialogues, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Italy. And JD will just go over some things that is expected of you from the global dialogues. Yeah, uh, so my name is JD. I am a global uh, coordinator at World in Conversation. I've been doing this for a few years now. Uh, about five years ago, I was sitting in your seats. Uh, it was not a mandatory uh, thing for the class then to have a global dialogue. So it's a really cool opportunity for everybody in here to be able to speak with somebody from a different country. And many of those people have never been to the United States. Uh, I just wanted to give like a few pointers and tips for you all. Uh, many of you in this room, uh, English is your first language. And so native speakers tend to speak their language a little quicker than other people. I just want to remind you all that when speaking, if you could just slow your speech, uh, for all of our INTS participants, um, so international participants pretty much, uh, so that they're able to understand you, uh, you know, as clearly as possible. Another thing that I wanted to say was uh, if you are using, you know, cultural jargon or slang, something like that, um, please do. Uh, they love to know and to understand uh, English a little bit better. But if you do use these uh, phrases or terms that aren't really known globally, please make sure that you explain yourself and what that means or else you may leave some of our participants confused. Um, another thing is, uh, please, please, please use names. Uh, I know that foreign names may be intimidating to try and uh, pronounce, but it really humanizes the conversation when you all are trying uh, and it you know, highlights the individual and acknowledges their presence and their statements and all that good fun stuff. And last but not least, some of our globals start relatively early in the morning, so I just wanted to tell you all, please get a good night's rest, show up with energy. Uh, most of the people we meet with, this is towards the evening hours uh, of their day, uh, so they're just ending as you're waking up. Please get your coffee and you know, just show up with, I don't know, just positivity and uh, just good vibes. Uh, please, please, please uh, recognize this as an opportunity, as I said prior. Uh, not many people get to have this kind of dialogue and talk about the topics that we will be talking about with people outside of their normal friend groups or their parents, let alone people in different countries across the world. So I just wanted to let you all know that. And going in with this knowledge, uh, dialogues will probably be a lot better than if you were just to show up without any sort of prior warning or understanding of what you're getting into. Hey, JD, so one thing about names, so the, the, so our partners at the other ends, they're told as well to use names, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and if you're afraid that you're going to mess someone's name up, well, they're going to mess your name up. Nobody ever calls <laughs> me by my name. My name is Sam. Nobody ever calls me Sam. It's Sam. It's Sam. It's Sam. 
It's something other. It's never Sam, which is awesome. It's great. It's fine, right? So don't be, a, it's just, I think it's the humanizing thing. They're, you know, they're going to mess your name up. You mess their name up, but still do it anyway because it's awesome. Um, J.D., before you introduce our guests, Miriam, can you just, we want to show you one thing really fast. Um, this is how you l sign up for Globals and Locals, right? Um, so if you click on the email we sent last Thursday, it will take you to this page. I've never seen this before, so. Um, so when you click on your dashboard right there, it should bring you here, and this is how you can track like the dialogues that you've already registered for and you show the ones you've showed up for. So if you scroll down, <laughs> if you scroll down here, it should say social 119 block one, and it will keep changing as the weeks go by in the different blocks. And um, so this is Olivia's dashboard, and it says, you can unregister, but don't register. Yeah, if you need to unregister, do it. Yeah, you can do it. We got a few emails asking if they can reschedule. You're allowed to do that, but just make sure that you can reschedule for um, a time that works for you. Just a little um, bit more about just rescheduling, please. As soon as you know you're unable to make a dialogue, especially a global dialogue, please unregister when you find out. If you wait until like the last moment and then unregister, that, de that ends up taking the seat away from somebody else who might have been able to join. I just wanted to highlight that for, for all of you. Yeah. Um, if you scroll down here, it should say social 119 global dialogues. This is not gonna change. You will not see uh, block one, block two. It will just say social 119 global dialogue. And so she registered for two dialogues, a global dialogue and a local dialogue for this block. So she does not have to register for another global dialogue, meaning that semester. for the remainder of the semester, just schedule for local dialogue. Awesome. Can I ask a question? This is coming from the live stream. Hey. What if someone wants to do more than one global dialogue? Can they do that? I would say uh, no. Not right now, anyway. At the end, if there are open seats and dialogues that are global, I would say, yeah, sure, fill them. But or, at this, or if you're like minutes away from it starting and there's a couple seats, you yeah. can jump in. Sure, I guess that works too. But um, there are limited amount of seats for globals. They're not like locals, and they're not as easy to uh, schedule just on a whim. So, like I said, if you're signed up for dialogue, please, please, please make it and try not to take up extra seats in Globals to ensure that all of you get a chance to participate in a dialogue. Okay, so we have a couple guests here. Um, T bro, Alex. Alex, uh, where's Olivia Casey? You were in a Global Dialogue today. Come on up. Um, you can sit, turn, turn around facing the camera. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yo. Hello, hello. You can't see me. Shahad, Maliha, how are you? You can unmute, by the way. Hello, everyone. Yeah, hello, everyone. Hey, how Hi. are you? Hey. Fine. Hey, so tell, tell the class who you are and where you are. Okay, so I am Shahad, and I'm calling from Iraq. Uh -huh. <laughs> We're, we're in Iraq. Where are you from in Iraq? Oh, I'm in the northern region of Iraq, so Erbil, Iraq. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I'm Maliha. <laughs> yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Maliha. I'm from Afghanistan, but now I'm living in Netherlands, in Amsterdam. And, but now I travel to Berlin, Germany, for 10 days. Yeah. Awesome. And, and Thank you. These, these two young women are both coordinators for World in Conversation, work for World in Conversation, um, have went through the program, and Malia has been with us, Malia, for, I don't know, a long time, right? Like I think, uh, yes, yeah, five years and one semester, yeah. I think so. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. So, go ahead. Maybe, maybe ask, so you, you two did dialogues. What, what did, hey, by the way, can you, we want to introduce you, can you introduce yourselves? Yeah, um, so my name's Alex. Uh, I'm a freshman student here in nursing. Uh -huh. It's on. 
Um, I'm Olivia, and I'm a junior bio studying biology this year. Cool. And you were in a dialogue this morning with, with what? With who? It was Najaf in Iraq. With Najaf? It was the very first global dialogue we held this semester. So, did, so was Shahad in that? Did you meet them, Shahad? No. Okay. Shahad's in Erbil. So how did, what, did you all, what did you talk about? Uh, the driving question um, talked about, it asked us to respond to a statement, um, and the statement basically said, oh, I'm trying to remember the, the wording, it was like that people in all countries, there are groups in all countries that have a head start. We were asked to respond to the statement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how was it overall? Uh, I enjoyed it. Um, I've only done one uh, world in conversation before, and it was a local one for another class. And I really felt like people had a lot more to bring to the table here. Um, there were people from Iraq, and they were able to bring in like news stories that they'd heard of from their country and share their own perspective on that issue and using that as like evidence. And I thought that was really cool. Uh huh. Olivia, how about you? Um, I just thought that it was just like a really humbling experience, and I think a lot of other people thought the same. That um, the experience of talking to the people from Iraq, especially a lot of the um, women that were talking were sharing their stories and um, just getting to have the lives that we do was, I don't know, definitely a blessing that we didn't realize. Have you ever spoken with Iraqis before? Never. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, very cool. Awesome. And how, like, how was it at all? Like, what were you surprised about? Let me ask you that. Was there anything that really surprised you? No, hang on, that's a closed-ended question, JV. <laughs> what was something that, uh, it's not speaking to the mic, what was something that you ended up taking away from the dialogue that you didn't expect to take away, you know, as you entered? Um, one of the, I think it's, it's Iraqi, is that how you describe somebody? Yep. Um, one of the Iraqi girls was um, talking about her, um, a young girl in her country that was um, basically burned for turning down a guy and they she was blamed for it and it was just like a really shocking story and I just never expected to be like, I guess my thoughts to be completely flipped like that and to realize how grateful I am. Mm -hmm. Alex, how about you? Uh, I guess my like more like general takeaway was that it's like a good, it was an opportunity to see like how some of our problems that we experience here in America and some of our social problems that we experience here are similar to social problems in other countries and how they're unique as well. Mm -hmm. like Yo, that. very cool. I like that. Okay, uh, for Maliha and Shahad. Hello. <laughs> I was just wondering for you all and your experience with the participants you've had in the past. Um, yeah, I'm looking at this. <laughs> What what is it that uh, what's and like what's a selling point or what's so um, exciting or or um, I guess worthwhile for participants to come in and uh, just spend their time in dialogue with Americans? Yeah, what, what who wants to go first? Go ahead, Shahad. <laughs> Um, okay, I was actually thinking about that the other day because um, I was a participant first for my si like side of the side of the screen, I guess. And what made me come back each week, especially that first semester, because I was in every week, every dialogue that first semester with Arbel, um, is just like being able to share experiences with uh, people who have different cultures from us, but at the same time finding similarities between us and them and kind of erasing that line of us and them because we are uh, inherently like humans or all humans. So it just made us closer, even though we were on two different sides of the world, but it was such a amazing experience. And yeah, it just, it was wonderful to go, go and talk to these people each week and just see how we are all inherently the same mm -hmm. different experiences but the same so i'm hearing it's almost like we're making the bridges that separate our cultures and people like smaller yes that sounds about right and, the, and these were all students in social 19 
couple years ago. Uh huh. Awesome. Maliha, how about you? What, what, why is, you know, because for Afghans, I mean, it's really, it's a lot of work for Iraqis as well, but it's a lot to get to where you need to go, to dialogue and so on. And what just keeps bringing people out? Okay, uh, so, you know, uh, dialogue uh, was, uh, at the previous, was the very uh, excited program for Afghan people because uh, they very like to talk with, uh, especially with uh, United States uh, students, because uh, they, in some part, they like to practice their English, and in the other part, they like to uh, share what their ideas and know others' idea. And uh, around five years, uh, the the, ex the excited point for me was, uh, you know, some of the students from Penn, Penn, Penn University, they asked, where is Afghanistan? <laughs> so at first, uh, they didn't know even uh, some of them, but uh, so that, uh, that program was uh, very good because uh, they uh, changed their culture. As uh, Shahad said, uh, the culture are, th there is lots of similarity between cultures, but not different. You know, Afghan students, they thought that maybe there is totally different uh, from uh, our um, culture in Afghanistan, but not. After they talk and uh, the um, program was done, so they said, for me, for example, they say, wow, uh, they look like us. Yeah. So uh, from this, uh, through this program, they got to know that um, the world is uh, small but the border makes separate between people. So this is the interesting part for me also. Mm -hmm. Hey, Shahad, did you lose electricity there for yeah. a hot minute? Yeah, <laughs> I knew this was going to happen. It was inevitable. <laughs> if anybody is in uh, a dialogue uh, with some of our partners, that's a very frequent thing. So if you notice that some of their participants' power goes out, just know that it's going to kick right back on very shortly. Yeah. Love being an example. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, so you, um, so I want to, we'll move forward here in a second, but um, just like lasting, you know, like Americans, I don't know, like you, this, these, these two countries have been so intertwined. Your, your two countries, right? Iraq and Afghanistan have been so intertwined with the United States. And like, and we, we don't reach out, we don't connect, we don't understand. And uh, it's such a unique opportunity, right? So I'm really, I just wanna say to the two of you, I'm really thankful um, Thank you. that you are willing to continue to recruit people and work with us. And are there any final things that you would tell my class that they, should do or could do to get the most out of these conversations? Okay. Um, just ask us questions. If you guys are curious about anything, ask the participants questions, especially if it's related to the topic that you guys are talking about, or if you see that it kind of like branches out from that topic, like don't be afraid. Talk to them. They're excited to be there. They want to be there. And yeah, that's what drives them. They want to share their stories. They want, want to tell you about what they're going through and what they see in the world. Because I feel like we see each other as villains sometimes. And just having that, that opportunity to talk to each other, to humanize each other, that's an amazing thing. And I think you guys should go for it. Like, do not be shy. Do not, do not like hold yourself back because they really want to talk to you guys. They want to know about you. They want to tell you about themselves. So yeah, just go for it. That's what I have for you guys, I guess. Just go for it. Awesome. Awesome. Maliha, final mm -hmm. words here. <laughs> okay. For me, I want to tell every student that they join a dialogue program, uh, share the ideas that you get from the students that you talk 90 minutes with them, and tell to everyone in the United States, uh, 
like your friends and families about the people, normal people in Afghanistan and even in Iraq about their life because I like to know uh, world know about Afghanistan behind the war. Not everyone may hear the Afghanistan word or Iraq. They think that there is lots of war, but please share the peaceful parts also because mostly students they talk about their normal life so in in everyone's normal life there is no war thank you yeah yeah thank you that's really powerful yep yeah hey so um thank you to the two of you and thank you so much yeah oh it's just so it's so nice to have you here and Maliha, we're going to do a class on, uh, on, on Afghanistan, what's happening in Afghanistan. We're going to bring Rafi in, and, and maybe we'll have you back. Um, and and, uh, and Shahad uh, Basim always comes into class, so, you know, Basim will be here. <laughs> so it's really, yeah, thanks to the two of you. It's really awesome Thank work you. that you're doing. So. Thank you for having us. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for this being was here. amazing, guys. Yes, okay. thank you. Um, okay, be well. All right. Um. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I should have taken a photo of them. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right. Hey, can you can you tell him to get back on? Yeah. Can you, can you ask him? Maybe not. They're probably gone. Okay, we good? Thanks, Todd. All right, thanks, bro. Man. Okay, y'all. Um, here's what I would like to do. Um, could we... Is there a, a, a student... Is there anybody in the class today... Uh, we, I, didn't, I didn't pull a specific volunteer down, but... Is there anybody in the class today? It would be nice if I had somebody down in the front who we could, who could talk. Maybe just be here. I could just check in with at a couple of points. But someone who feels particularly uh, patient. Hey, if, we get them, if you can get them back on, I, wanna, I just want to take a photo of them on the screen. It's so annoying. But if you can't, that's okay. Did anyone take a photo, by the way? Anybody? Man, all right. Um, Hey, uh, if there's somebody in the class who feels particularly, like, feels like a, a, a patriotic, just like patriotic, especially an American would be really nice. No, it really an American. It feels particularly, not, you know, extremely patriotic, but, like, you feel like, yeah, you really love the country and you're patriotic. Anybody who would want to volunteer who could say that? Bro, you want to do it? Okay. What's that? Okay. <laughs> um, now push it up. You can sit up there. What, what's your name? I'm Steven. Steven? All right, man. Nice to meet you. Why, wait, why did you clap for Steven? Is it because of his Greek <laughs> letters or because he's patriotic? <laughs> like, whatever. Where, where are you from? I'm from Dallas, Texas. Dallas, Texas. Oh, my God. All right. Oh, God. All right. Dude, there's like, there's somebody else in class from Dallas, you know. Do you know that? Wait, who, who's the woman from Dallas? Where, where are you? Anyway, there is. Uh, last semester, we had, some, oh, right there, there's. What part? Dude, there's, that's him, but there's somebody else. Damn, there's somebody. All right. Anyway, listen, man. Um. What I'm going to do, I'm just going to talk, okay? And your job, you can, do you want to move back because you're sort of center stage, but are you comfortable there? You're good? All right, man. Um, what, what do you think makes you patriotic? I think America is one of the greatest countries to live in. Uh, it's the land of the free. It's one of the most free countries, freedom of speech. We have God-given rights uh, in the Constitution, and uh, just got to be thankful to be here. Okay, and guns, and guns. <laughs> Guns, definitely. We love the guns in Texas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And big hats, right? And boots and, like, tacos and... All right. Uh, 
When I think about Texas, I think about tacos. So, like, I mean, all you need are tacos. Oh, yeah, know? we got the best Mexican food. Dude, I can say that I had some of the best Tex-Mex ever. Okay, so listen, here's what I want to do, bro. So, I'm not patriotic, right? And, it, and it, I'm not, I'm, gonna, I'm kind of patriotic. But here, I want to tell you what I mean by that, right? So, first off, I think the world needs, each society is bounded by political borders, right? So we have these geographic regions in the world, and the geographic regions have these political borders, and they change over time, and, you know, and like, ah, oh, it's terrible, and there's so much war, and so on and so forth, right? And so in an ideal world, we want sta- everyone wants stability. You know, Shahad and Maliha, they, all, they want stability. We want stability. Everybody wants stability, right? So there's a way in which patriotism is really important because it helps to build stability, right? So you need people in a society that, are, that feel a sense of patriotism. And so it's, so it's important, right? So I think like, yep, this is really good. We also need people in a society who can stand in multiple places, right? Who don't, who don't just like plant themselves in one place, but can go, you know, can go to a- Afghanistan and feel, you know, really, uh, um, can feel really good or can go to Iraq or Mexico or Haiti or whatever, right? Just like you would go to Texas or New York and be like, hey, there's still the United States, it's all good, right? I'm just, I just happen to be one of those people, which doesn't mean I, I don't love the United States or I don't love another country or whatever. It just means that the world also needs people like me who can be the bridges, right? Who can, would do things like this, like have us talk to people around the world. Not to say, so they can tell, you know, these folks that, you know, their country's better or whatever the case, but just so you can just build these bridges and so on, right? So I wouldn't call myself patriotic. I would, patriotic, I would call myself a, a, like a citizen of the world. And I think if everyone was a citizen of the world like me, this would be a problem. It would be a problem. I think we need a balance. We need some people who are more patriotic and some people, a few people who are more citizens of the world. And then th- I think that balances things out, right? So that's where I'm starting from at this point, right? Is that, th- what do you hear me saying? Or yeah, what do you hear me I mean, I think uh, you can be patriotic about your country and um, be sort of a global citizen as well and speak to people in other countries. But I think what's important about America, America is a melting pot. You have people from different cultures, Mm -hmm. people from different countries. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that can unify us together is having, you know, faith in the United States. Have faith. Well, just believing. Yeah, yeah, not, not like... Not religion. I'm talking no, no, about I just got your faith, nights. right? The belief that the, that, that the country can be better than what it is. To, yeah. Can be better tomorrow than what it is today. Absolutely. Yeah, it can always improve. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I'm completely with you. And, and I have that faith, right? And I think the U.S. is, first off, I think the U.S. is the single most amazing, and I think amazing in so many ways, like, but like, country that has ever existed there's never been an example like the united states that had both the the you know just the worst of the worst and the best of the best and somehow managed to be to only have one civil war over the course of so much time like it really is as a sociologist i will say that this is an absolutely amazing country okay so when i for me when i critique it it's all, it's critique it because I want it to be better tomorrow than it is today. But I'm also a person who will look back and be like, hey, man, this is, this is really an amazing place, right? But sometimes people who are really patriotic feel like I should be more like them. Whereas what I say is, no, 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 I need to be me. You need to be you because we need patriotic people or else we're all just like, whatever, right? You got to have people that are just like, believe so much in the country that they just build it, right? And if every country has that, then that's a good thing. And then we need people like me who balance it out, right? So is that, so we're good. Any questions do you have? I mean, yeah, I'd say uh, patriotism. It's about believing in your country, but, and everything great about it, but also wanting to build upon it and make it a better place. Okay, I got you. Okay, that's cool. That's fair. I like that. Okay, so next, uh, next slide. Can we, so I have this thing, so I did a talk 
a number of years ago, a TED Talk called A Radical Experiment in Empathy. And what I did was I put the listeners into the shoes of an average, ordinary Muslim living in Iraq. Just average person. And then I put people in the shoes of, an, of a person in Iraq of who then got to the place where they supported then I put people in the shoes of a, quote, terrorist, right, who is fighting against the United States and ultimately fighting against Americans who were in Iraq and trying to kill soldiers. And my thing was, no, you need to go in their shoes. If you don't understand what, why they're fighting, why they want to kill Americans, then you can't understand anything. You know what I mean? Like, people think, oh, they're crazy, they're nuts. I'm like, they're not crazy and nuts. Talk to them. They have reasons for that. So if you don't sit down and talk to them, you will never be able to really understand what it is, you'll, you won't be able to stop their behavior. So people thought, some people, people in the military, by the way, high ups in the military, I got lots of people, lots of militaries are even around the world communicated with me saying like, dude, that was, I, we've been trying to teach our soldiers that forever, you know, so I, I did, we had a big project, and the reason I know Maliha, and I know, uh, uh, Shahad is because of that talk, right? And because of work, a project we had with NATO and U.S. military and so on, right? But a lot of people thought I was anti-American because they should, you should never ask anybody to have to put themselves in the shoes of terrorists. And I'm like, why not? Like, why wouldn't you do that? Like, this is thinking. That's what this is about. That's what I do. This is what I do for a living. Like, it doesn't mean you have to support them, but it means you have to but go there. Does that make yeah, it definitely makes sense. I mean, in my opinion, um, you know, people who grew up in sort of the Eastern values that uh, they had in those countries, um, they just think of the Western ideology as um, not superior. It's not right. Just, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's just, wait, hang on. So they think of the West as, they don't see us as superior. They don't see them, most of the people... Well, they see it as a threat. They see the a Western threat. ideology yep. as a threat to their okay. ideology. Yep, okay. So my thing is, so I've, so I've been pushing this idea of empathy for a long time. In fact, my wife and I are, have been recognized as the, the found... The founders? The husband? I don't know what... Fuck, I don't know. You know, the media, they say things and then whatever, but of radical empathy, right? So empathy begins with connection and results in an understanding. You, got to, you connect with people and then you understand. That's what all this work is about that we do in here, okay? So I want to give you, go, if you can go to the next slide. It's like at the end of the last class, remember I put this up? And like, if you look, this is the number of Americans in the United States who approve, a percentage of Americans who approve of uh, um, or disapprove of mixed race marriages, right? Or approve of it, right? In 1959, 4% of Americans approved of, mixed r- of marriages between black people and white people in the United States. 4%, man. But look, out, look at how it increases. It's like in a short period of time. I mean, this is my lifetime. I was born in 1960. And like in such a short period of time, look at what happens. And we're up here in 2013, it's 87. And it has continued to climb. It's higher now. So like what I would say is because what happened as a result of the civil rights movement, this is what I was saying last class, that I didn't fully close it at the end. Because black people and white people came together. They worked side by side. They slowly started, their people started going, their kids started going to the same schools. People started uh, living in the same neighborhoods. It was all very slow, but it was happening over this period of time. And then look how the change happened. People suddenly were like, oh, okay. It's, it's okay for black people and white people to get married. And so this is, if we go with what I just said, empathy begins with a connection, and then it, it transforms into an understanding. Like, people didn't want to come together. You know, so many white people fought this idea of coming together, right, because they were, you know, mired in their racist beliefs. But they were forced into a connection, and then they started to say, like, oh, my God. And by the way, there were a lot of black people who didn't want anything to do with white people either. But people came together. And I'm like, that's awesome, man. That's just awesome, right? So any thought? Did, do you see that with that? Like, does that strike you? I think it's great. I think this 
is patriotic. Yes. You know, I think that, you know, the whole civil rights movement is patriotic. Yep. Wanting African Americans to have the same rights as white people under the yep. Constitution. Yep. Extremely patriotic. Yeah, it should be, right? So the people who didn't have that, the people who fought that, to me are like, what are you fighting? This is what this is what the, this country was founded upon, even though we didn't include slaves in the Constitution, right? They weren't part of that because people didn't grant equal citizenship to people of African ancestry, anybody except Europeans. But, but still, g get with it, man. Like, this is what the civil rights movement was. Like, Martin Luther King was one of the single... Pro, the single, not just him, it was a whole movement, but one of the single most patriotic human beings in the entire 20th century. Most patriotic Americans in the entire 20th century. Because he's saying, we need to come together, y'all. We are one country. Come together. And then ultimately we see this thing. So I'm with you. I'm with you. All right. D next slide. Do you know the difference between these two things? Yeah, I'd say patriotism... Well, not completely. I th this is what I think. Patriotism is more like just um, having, yeah, more like faith in your country, believing in your country. Nationalism is more of like a political ideology, if I'm uh -huh. correct. It's more like believing, um, more like industry should be based in that country. Everything yeah. should be originated from that country. Um, am I correct? I, I could be wrong. I don't no, know. no, no. You, okay. Mostly nationalism gets turned. Dude. You're, you're killing it, by the way. Yeah. Not, it's not easy, right? But you seem like it's pretty easy for you. But it's not easy coming down here and talking about this stuff, right? But you're, you're killing it. Yeah. Oftentimes, nationalism gets touted as a political thing. Here's a fundamental sociological distinction, right? Patriotism is the idea that your country, um, you live in a great country, you're connected to all the people, and that... Um, you, you want the best for your country, but you don't want to step on any other countries. You know, nothing at all. You just really want the best for your country, right? Nationalism, you, you kind of step over into the world of nationalism when you say, mine is the best country, because that's then what allows you to commit acts against other countries and other people that you would never want committed against you, right? The golden rule. All religions are based on a golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And that when you walk into the world of nationalism, it's when you walk into the world of whatever, I'm going to do this because I just want to advance me, right? So you bordered on it when you said, I think the United States is, you know, it's a great country. I love my country. And I think it's, you said, one of the greatest countries in the world. Which is like, okay, awesome. If you said the greatest country in the world, now you're bordering in the world of nationalism, right? But you said one of, which is like, okay, I don't know. If you said the greatest country, I would ask you right now, how many other countries have you visited and lived in? How many other languages do you speak? How many other whatever? Like, how do you know that? How can you say that? That's what I would say if you had said the greatest country. But you said one of the greatest countries, and I would agree with that. So like, okay. But I would agree with it probably for different reasons than you. Is that cool? Are we like? Yeah. Okay. Um, so here. Go to the Are you familiar with what's going on in, uh, yeah, I've, in I've Ukraine? And Do you have any idea? Could you say, sum, it, sum it up in a um, couple statements? I know that Russia is essentially trying to take over Ukraine. Uh, Russia is trying to establish. Ukraine is, I assume it's territory and just expand the Russian empire, or uh -huh. I, I guess not an empire. Okay. Um, do you know why? Like, what's, do you have any idea why or what the story is? What's your, na when you think, well, about, hang, I on, mean, hang on, wait, hang on. When you think about Russia doing that, what's your natural feeling toward Russia? Well, I mean, you have to bring up the history with the USSR. No, yeah, but, okay, I got, okay, and, okay. And NATO and all okay. that. Well, what's your feeling about Russia doing that? Is it like, all right, whatever. Or is it negative? It's like, no, we got to stop them. We got. Uh, it's it's pretty negative. I mean, Ukraine. Uh huh. So. Yeah. Oh, that's yours. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um. <coughs> okay, it's pretty you, negative. Yeah, because right. I mean, Ukraine's its own nation. And yeah. It has the right to be its own nation. I don't think it's right that Russia's just coming in there, trying to take over. Mm-hmm. And when you think about Russia doing that, and you think about the United States, 
Do you have any examples that come to mind of when the United States has done that or when we're doing it, even like right now, where in the world we're doing that? Um, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm aware that the United States has a lot of troops located around the world and they're trying to establish U.S. diplomacy in other countries. Uh -huh. um, I guess you could use that as a comparison, but, and obviously, okay, the U.S. has um, fought in, you know, the Korean War and the Vietnam War, so they're trying to establish themselves there. But weren't they, in those situations, fighting on behalf of those independent nations? Weren't they, isn't it a little bit different? Because they're not essentially trying to take over and make it the United States? Um, well, Russia is not trying to make the Ukraine Russia. They're really trying to establish their Ukraine as part of the Russian Federation. So they okay. don't want it. To well, I didn't know. I, I thought they were yeah. actually trying. No, no, that's okay. That's okay, dude. This, I'm not, this is all. So they're not trying to do that. They just want to. They just don't want Ukraine to align with. With hey, by the way, the reason you should pay attention right now to what. To, the reason you should listen to what we're talking about because this actually, we are in a really, really dangerous moment right now the entire world is it's really dangerous it's one of the single most dangerous moments that i've experienced in my 61 years on the planet and so that's why i said i got we got to talk about this right but i, I want to do it in a way that you'll hear what i'm saying and I, but this is really dangerous y'all you really want to follow this a little bit or don't just go enjoy because if things blow up like what do you want to do spend your you know, Drink beer, do whatever you want to do. Like, yeah, go play basketball. Okay, so, uh, so the idea. But when I when I see that, I'm just like, whoa, okay, we got to stop these Russians, right? We have to stop, right? So I asked you, what do you know about cases either today or through U.S. history when we do a similar thing, and and why do you think I asked you that? Uh, because it sort of goes back to the idea of nationalism uh -huh. and sort of, you know, establishing the ideals of America and other countries and stuff like that. Okay. And what, and is, so what do you think about me doing that? Like if I talk about Russia, but I'm like, hang on, we're going to talk about Russia. But before we do that, we also got to talk about the United States here. How do you feel about that? Or should I just talk about Russia and not talk about the United States? Um, I mean, all right. Personally, I prefer the ideals of the United States, and I believe that those free values would be, it would be better for the world if more countries embraced them. Yeah. Um, am I super in favor of the United States going into these territories and fighting on behalf of uh, certain regimes? Uh, I'm not really sure. Um, obviously, we didn't. Vietnam didn't turn out very well, nor did Korea. Do you, so. do you know how many civilians were killed in Vietnam and Cambodia? I don't know the exact number, but it was a lot. Like how? What do you, what's your guess? A uh, couple million. No, okay. Sorry. All right. So in your mind, what, it's more than that, but that's okay. You got a couple million in your mind. Can you picture civilians, right? People just like this, like right here. Can you picture? two, three million or something? Can they like go there? Like do you like, whoa, your family, everyone you know, my family, your house, your everything, right? Can you like, can you hold that? Like, oh, yeah. it, it's, it's way too many people, obviously. Okay, and all right. So um, now what I'm, now this is what you need to know about, I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna talk about some things here. What you need to know is, I'm not equalizing you, the United States or Russia. They're two very different societies okay very different political systems if I, if I could snap my fingers and Putin would just be wherever Putin would go I don't know I think lovely I so I'm not equalizing it okay this is what's really important sometimes when I talk about stuff like this people think oh you're just comparing us to the road the, 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 you're, you're just making it seem like it's the same I'm not making it seem like it's the same I think it's we need to critique Russia right now 
but you can't really critique Russia if you don't understand, if we don't understand why Russia is doing what Russia is doing. And the best way to understand why Russia is doing what Russia is doing is to see where we did the same thing. If I can understand where we do it, like if I can understand the places where I do something wrong, where I do it, then I can understand when you do it wrong. You know what I mean? Then I can be like, oh, I get why Stephen did that. Like, because like, ah, oh, because I did a similar thing, right? That kind of thing. So I sometimes get critiqued because people think I should only talk about the good things or the positive things in the U.S. or whatever the case is. Yeah. Makes sense? Yeah. Okay. So here, I'm going to... Oh, so here's a question from the chat. How many years of U.S. history uh, have we been at war? <laughs> a lot. I don't think there's any year where we haven't been at war. Actually, that's the nature. Of, I mean, that's the nature of who, who we are. Na that's not because we're the most violent country. It's just the nature of how the United States has grown and what we've done, right? So there hasn't been a single year when the Russians weren't at war. You know what I mean? This is France. I mean, I don't, it's like... Okay, so um, here, go to, the, go to the next slide. So here we have, this is the U.S. and the USSR, right? After World War II, the world essentially got divided into two, two like, camps. The, the, you know, the, the, the eagle, that's the U.S. and NATO, um, the blue, and then the bear, we call it, and that would be uh, the Soviet Union, the communists, right? Communist countries. So we have China here, we have... Um, everything in red, including Cuba down here. Um, we could put Nicaragua here, partly red. So this is all aligned with the Soviet Union. The Union of the Soviet Socialist Republic is what USSR stands for. And then and Russia was the main country. This is Russia. And then, you know, we're associated with NATO and the U.S. and so on, right? And so we divided the world up. We fought, a pro we fought the Cold War. Do you, you know something about this, right? Yes. What do we, why did we fight the Cold War? Well... Russia was expanding, uh, or the USSR, they were expanding communism, you know, throughout Eastern Europe and different places there, Vietnam and Korea, uh -huh. obviously. Um, and so, I mean, the United States and other uh, free nations took that as a threat. Yeah. Um, and we didn't necessarily go to war. We just had, I mean, well, there were wars that resulted in it, the Korean and Vietnam, but um, it was more of like different competing it was okay. kind of competing so when you when we expanded capitalism into south into latin america what what was how would you describe that i'm not too aware of that part of history okay I don't okay remember. Yeah. okay all right so here you you should and i wouldn't expect you to be right i mean look i'm 61 i'm a perfect this is what i do you know what i mean okay so we talk about the u.s and democracy and so on every every country we see ourselves more positively we see ourselves positively, right? Even those of you who are complete assholes. You, you never do the dishes at your apartment. You're always leaving the lights on. You're leaving the heat up. You're doing all the stuff. Like, you know, that you're doing it all. You're, you, you think it's your roommate, but it's really you. And, like, for half of you, it's you. Half of this class, you know what I mean? Half of this class, you're the asshole. But if I say, which ones of you are, like, tw how many of you are the asshole where you live? Raise your hand. Dude, look at this. Like, there aren't many hands going up, right? And it should be half of you. And so this is how we operate. So here, what I, what I will say is that every, everything, everything we would say, okay, hang on, everything we would say about the Soviet Union expanding the U.S. was expanding. We were expanding our markets. We were expanding, you know, we just, we called it freedom, but they called it freedom. Like, you know, it's the same thing, right? So we're, ex yo, hang on, come back. Hey, Osa and Ogana, are we good? All right, so um, here, go to the next slide. This just came out in the news the other day. Is anybody from Guatemala in here? Any family from Guatemala? Okay, so um, this just came out. These are women who had a lawsuit against paramilitaries. Um, these women were part of these indigenous rural communities um, who were, uh, their, the men were taken away and killed and put into mass graves. Many of the women were as well. Women were, um, uh, I, you know, this is, just horrible things happened to them. And the, and the people who did, did this were soldiers in the Guatemalan military who were 
uh, trained by the United States. We gave them weapons. Um, we d every, every, everything that happened. We supported it we, all through Latin America, right? And the reason we did is because, if you can go back one slide, um, we did not want any of this to turn red. And these people, go ahead, one more slide. These people were talking about things like freedom and democracy and safety and security. And they were critiquing their governments who were taking their land and stealing their resources. And we called them communists. And then, you know, we sent the resources down that their countries could destroy them. So hundreds of thousands to, in, in Guatemala, the number is like 200, 300 thousand people civilians were killed outright and then just one thing after another right so the one thing i studied from your age on to into my 30s i spent time i studied this right i studied i'm a latin americana so like i studied the church i studied violence i studied right wing violence. i lived in latin america i was traveling back and forth all the time and the things the people i met who have been tortured by the united states by the like, innocent people right it's just like the stories that i could tell you are just absolutely horrific and it's the same thing we were imposing our ideas on it right so we don't even have to go to vietnam we can just go here to latin america but we did it for good reason right so let me give you what the russians are saying go to the next slide but hang on go back actually so what i want to say to you is so you said this thing i don't really know um well i understand that they're trying to you know promote capitalism and you know, yeah. have as many countries on their side as possible. Yeah. But what you don't understand, because you don't know, and, I, and I'm not, and I, and I don't think you should, and, nobody, and, and other people don't know, what you don't understand, and again, because you don't know, is the horrific actions that have been undertaken around the world on the part of the United States. I mean, horrible, horrible, horrible things. Like, look up, the island of East Timor, right? Two, there's 600,000 people on the island, and we gave their permission and s bought all the weapons to massacre one third of the island. 200,000 civilians died in a very short period of time. Like, that was us, right? But that's just one. I mean, I could give every example. But, and I don't only talk about that, because remember, the United States is an awesome place. I work with people in the military. There are uh, people in policing. Like, come on, man, this is not black and white. But we've done some horrible horrible things and we shouldn't just look at those things right we should also look at the good but we also have to look at some of the bad so like for example in here we have conversations we're going to have dialogues with with students in Yemen and you know in this class the Saudi and Emirati students y'all need to be talking to some Yemeni students get their side of the story of this conflict right do you, you know that a, 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 a shelter was just bombed the other day? 70, 70 innocent Yemenis, mostly children, were massacred by a bomb. And I forget whether it was by the UAE or the Saudis dropped the bomb. It's like you ought to find that out a little bit, right? But so this, let me, I want to give you the Russian side of the story, okay? So, um, so here, so this, here's, 1949 to 198, you can see this, right? So this is what was the Soviet Union. And they just took over these countries after World War II. And I don't think it's a good thing. I wish we hadn't. We hadn't just sort of given up to the Soviet Union, but we did, and NATO did, and Western Europe did. And so this is Crimea right here. And Crimea, the Russians put their, their largest naval base that they had, the Soviet Union did, the Soviets did, right here in the, in the tip of Crimea. And this is the key to everything. Because, you, you know, you, you want to be able to come through uh, Turkey, like the Bosphorus and so on, like right through here, and come out into the, into the Atlantic. I mean, this is everything for the Russians. This is like the key. People say that Crimea is the key to controlling that whole region of the world. And, and the Russians had that. And the Russians are saying, listen, y'all, you keep pulling these countries over here to the NATO side, and we're looking out for our geopolitical interests like you take them so i'm just going to be the Ru i'm going to be the russians for a second right you keep these were part of the soviet empire then the soviet empire breaks down in 89 and one by one you keep like pulling them over into nato and like that's 
very destabilizing for us. Like, you can't do that. And especially Crimea. And Crimea is what we're fighting over right now. It's, so Crimea is part of the Ukraine. And, and it's separate, but it's part. And all these people around here, they speak Russian. And lots of people in Crimea speak Russian. And like there's, the Russians are saying, you, you can't, Ukraine, we are not letting Ukraine go toward NATO. We are not letting Ukraine go to the United States. It's too unsettling. It's too dangerous for us. Like, we don't want to do that. We need the Ukraine as part of our orbit because we're looking out for ourselves. And I thought, well, my God, that's what the United States has done. That's what we did all through Latin America. If you go back to those women, these women were, their, the, all the men in their communities, and they were, uh, I, again, I just imagine the worst possible things. All that happened to them because we didn't want to allow these countries to go toward a different orbit. We said, we're not going to let that happen. And so what we're going to do is we're going to allow the slaughter of millions and millions and millions of innocent people because we, the United States, don't want to allow this, these countries to go toward a different geopolitical orbit. And that's exactly what Putin and the Russians are saying about Crimea. You're not coming in here and you're not taking this. Like, this is us. We're going to have, they need to be aligned with us. Now, I, I'm like, I get that. Like, I never thought, it's not, I don't agree with it. I'm like, you know, F Putin anyway, right? I know things about him that you all don't know. No, but you don't know. You just hear this guy. But I read about it. Like, I know who he is. I know what they're doing. You know what I mean? I'm like, nah, no, no, no. But I get it. I understand. It's like, oh, shit. What does that mean? So what should, now what should we, which I understand what they do. So now what do I do? Well, I have a few questions. First, okay. um, well, Russia today, it's not the USSR. They don't yeah. have communism. It's the Russian they, Federation. They are trading with countries like Germany yep. and a few others. And us. So why is it so necessary that they establish themselves in Ukraine and um, Crimea? Um, yeah. If they're not trying to uphold communism versus capitalism, yeah. essentially. Because we have a state. Because first off, can you go back to this stuff? We, we all have these nuclear whis missiles pointed at one another. They're still our stated enemy, right? And we're still their enemy, and they're still our enemy, and we are still fighting the Cold War, even though it's not cold. It's actually warm now. So we're still fighting it out. And the reason we're fighting it out is because everybody's battling for resources in the world. You want to have more resources for your people than somebody else has for their, their people. So they're battling us for resource control. This is what's happening with China, right? So everyone's fighting for the precious resources of the world. So that's what they're doing. So like, oh, okay, I get that, right? So it doesn't matter that it's, the, it's Russia versus, it makes it all the more problematic for them. And, and for me, let me say a couple more things. Go to the next slide. So, so I've been to the Ukraine, right? So Lori, this is my wife here. So she was invited over for, uh, a conference um, to talk about women in war who were fighting down in Crimea. And these women right here are soldiers in the Ukrainian military who had just come back from the battlefield down in Crimea. And she was, she was moderating a panel for them, right? So I had the opportunity to really hear directly from them. And, the, you know, they want to kick the Russians out, right? So my idea is, like, not to support the Russians, but I want to understand them. Go to another slide. So we were, these are all civilians who signed up, just like you all would sign up, because someone invaded us, in, Mexico invaded us in the south, and we didn't have enough people in the military, and you all would just start sign, you know, signing up, and you put your fatigues on, and you got your boots, and you're ready to go, and you go get your guns, and if you don't have guns, other people well, you do, because you're from Texas. And so, you know, you go, and you go fight. You, and that's what they did, and these were all people who died right? And there are these memorials all over Kiev. And I'm like, oh, shit. This is real for me, right? Like, what, what Russia is doing is real for me. Next one. These are women who are making camouflage. They get all these netting, and they take different colored cloth, and they cut it up into little pieces, and they put the cloth, because they're going to hang it over things, all the, the equipment, because they didn't have it. Um, here's a shot of, next one. This is the main Maidan Square, where the, the Russians, they they set up a situation where they put snipers in all of these 
uh, like different windows around and they killed innocent people who were out, you know, uh, protesting, right? So final thing, but this is a photo of Lori and I in St. Petersburg, Russia. Yo, hang on, hang on one second. We're almost done. Uh, St. Petersburg, Russia with students. Um, and this is a, a, a Russian professor who, and we gave a talk about our work, right? So like I get them. They're just people like everybody, right? So for me, it's like, whoa. Anyway, final thought. Yo, hang on one second, Stephen. Final thought. Like what are you hearing me saying right now? I understand why Russia would now want to do this. Um, and I do see the relations between what Russia is doing now and what U.S. has had in the past. However, I think that um, Russia... I wait, yo, wait, hang on, hang on, hang on. Listen, we got one minute. Listen, listen, this, this is important that we, you hear this. Okay. okay, so not that the U.S. in those certain situations weren't trying to establish power, but it was also about an ideology. Would yeah. you agree with that? Yeah, which is I'm what not the Russians seeing, are saying. But Okay, but how is it an ideology in this circumstance? You yeah, said it was the about the thing. power. Yeah, that's the same right? thing, though. If you okay. study, if you talk to the people, in La those women in Guatemala, that's only one example. Okay, yeah. That's For them, it's, not a, it's, about an, it's about power. It's not about okay. an ideology. They don't care about freedom. Any, anyway, listen, dude. Yo, Stephen, give him applause. <laughs> that was awesome, man. Okay. All right, y'all. We will see you. How your voice shakes when you lie him. Make everything about you. And I'll just be a smile him. I'll still be here when we're in hard times. Hola, Belén. Hola. Soy de la clase de Drupal. Sí, se fue, se fue el tiempo, pero si quieres para la próxima clase, si estás por el chat, algún moderador del chat te contacta y volvemos a hacer el proceso si te sientes como lista para entrar. Dale, dale, gracias. Un abrazo, chao. Chao.